I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Rafe Mayer, former B.C. Cabinet Minister and Canada's longest-running number one radio talk show host. Welcome back to the show, Rafe. Thanks very much, Jim. Nice to be here. People are talking about how fast President Trump is following up on his promises. Apparently, he's already started digging or putting feelers out to build that giant wall on the Mexican border and somehow make the Mexicans pay for it. I can't believe it. You know, they're, they're talking about $8 billion, billion that is, and uh, most people are saying it'll be twice that anyway, and uh, I just can't imagine that this is happening in 2017, but I guess anything's possible. I thought we... Uh, knocked the last one down a few years ago and uh, and changed the world. But looks like old Donald's going to start all over again. Well, apparently he's going to be meeting with the Mexican president, but now people are wondering, will the Mexican president even agree to meet with him now that apparently, again, the, the wall thing is real? Well, I guess the Mexicans, I, I don't know the all the details of NAFTA and the trade differences and so on, but I, I suppose the... Uh, the Mexican president's got some problems with uh, a trade that could be changed or withheld and penalties imposed and that sort of thing. And uh, I guess it's uh, the only thing you can say is welcome to the world of Donald Trump. Uh, I don't think any of us really know how this is all going to play out in the end, but it doesn't sound good so far. Uh, you know, the things that I'm saying, Jim, I, and I, I'm almost speechless because they, they just are so different that anything I've ever thought would happen with a president of the United States in this day and age, but uh, but they're happening. And uh, uh, the thing that I find really uh, uh, interesting and, and I guess uh, pretty troubling, now, uh, the rundown on uh, MSNBC, uh, I think it was yesterday, on the number of lies the man has told, uh, and couple them with the falsehoods, because the falsehoods are what he calls the ones uh, that were intended to deceive. The rest were intended to deceive, and, and this is this is pretty scary. I mean, politicians aren't necessarily noted for sticking to the unvarnished truth with with every utterance, but uh, uh, this is really too much of you. You know, you can't rely upon a, a single solitary thing the man is saying. It's it's pretty scary. Well, I remember one of his thank you rallies after the election where he said to the crowd, you people fell for my line, lock her up, lock her up. And uh, every time I said it, you know, I went up in the polls, so I kept saying it. You people really bought that, didn't you? Well, I did a little uh, a blog for Facebook today. I, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, I suggested that uh, because I think she needs help in the coming election, uh, that uh, Christy Clark get a hold of uh, Trump and have him come out and campaign uh, after all, they, they both have the same dedication and, and, uh, and honor for the truth, so that they should get along very well together. And he would be very helpful to her. Uh, he can uh, tell a lie better than anybody ever, I've ever heard, with the possible exception of our local politicians. Well, of course, you have Kellyanne Conway, Trump's so-called advisor, saying, uh, well, you guys aren't reporting the alternative facts that he presents i know it's a, the whole language has become you know, pretty scary you know alternative facts and and falsehoods uh instead of law i mean the, it, it's getting really uh, so you know I, I just read and you probably read it too that uh, uh george orwell's 1984 has had a, 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 a rebirth it's taken off as something like gangbusters right now because it's the same situation as it was back in those days with uh a new speak and and uh, a big brother is watching you. The whole thing is, is repeating itself, and uh, they say history does that. I've never believed it. 
until now, but it certainly seems to be. But that that's true. George Orwell is uh, he's now one of the new hot shot uh, authors, and he's been dead for what fifty years, I guess, or more. Of course, uh, it was one of my favorite books because it pointed out things where the government propaganda would tell you, for example, we increased the chocolate ration to 140 grams when the week before it was 180. Yeah, yeah. But it was a marvelous book, and Animal Farm, his other great book, was also a good book, and he's, he's written a couple of others. I've got a little sort of collection of his here, and uh, he was he was a great writer, and I don't know that we have any of them floating around right now that uh, I could put my finger on, but he was he was excellent and uh, captured the times. And uh, strange that the times are 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 in the eyes of of the uh, of the consumer, the times are the same in, in 2017 as they were back in what 1947, 48, 49. That's uh, we haven't made much progress. Well, consider that the so-called economic engine of the planet, America, has become protectionist, and you have so-called China, uh, communist China saying they're in favor of free trade. Oh, you know, it's it's an amazing world. If uh, if my father were to come back now and uh, and have a look at the world, I think he'd figure that God had put him on the wrong earth. He has to go to, there's another one somewhere that's home. This one isn't, because everything has changed uh, just, just so much. Some of it for the better. I mean, there's no question that the treatment of women and uh, and uh, it's getting better with the, uh, with minorities and that sort of thing has changed. But uh, when you look at the whole uh, social structure, I, I'm really not sure. I, uh, I, I, I I shiver when I very rarely turn on television and and see a show and realize that little kids are watching that stuff. And uh, you know, I had a, a terrible experience with that back with 9-11, and um, I was taking calls, and a man phoned me up, and he said, you know, my little grandson, uh, he's, I think, was five or six, he, he was watching me uh, watch the rerun of the plane sitting in the buildings, and he said, you know what he said? He said, cool, Grandpa, cool. And I thought, oh, my God, we've anesthetized, you know, young minds, and, uh, and and that was a long time. It was 2011, and uh, it's, I think, it, it, it's it's... And no wonder that they're anesthetized when you see what is just normal, everyday uh, action on television. And I don't want to get on the end of that kick because I'm no expert. I watch uh, a great deal of television when there's a baseball game on, but that's about it. But uh, what I see from time to time, I uh, I just can't believe it. I really can't. And, and the society doesn't seem to have any constraints left in it. There, there's nobody standing up and saying, you know, this is a... A bad thing. I just went through a, a bit of a series with uh, uh, some people that write blogs, etc., about our our new uh, uh, minister of, uh, of foreign affairs. And uh, this this woman wrote this story about how this uh, our minister's uh, uncle uh, was a German officer in Krakow, Poland during the war. These terrible things that uh, he did, and two thousand words of this and. Uh, I'm sure they're probably all true, but somehow we were going to allow the minister to wear that. Now, I don't know about you, Jim, but I got a couple of uh, skeletons in my closet that I just assume not have people come out and, and, and get put out there. And I'm sure that most people, if a reporter came up and said, look, I want you to talk about your, your uncle Charlie, uh, you're, they're going to just shut up and say no. But the people that were involved in this said, oh, she should have stood up and told the world all about her grandfather. But all this happened, I might say, 25 years before she was born. But she should stand up and do this. And I was thinking to myself, you know, those kind of questions, I, they're, they're, I suppose they're fair enough in the sense that it's free speech. But those kind of questions, as a matter of good manners, would never be thought of, you know, not that all that long ago. But now the public are, are, are in writing me letters raging that she has an obligation to tell any reporter whatever has gone on in her family whenever. And I thought, my God, it, is, there, is there no protection of, of manners left? I don't want any legal protection. The fewer legal protections we have with free speech, the better. But whatever happened, as I say, to good old manners, where there's some things you just said, look, uh, frankly, that's just none of my damn business. So I'm not going to ask the question. 
even though I'm entitled to under free speech and blah, 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 I was not going to do it. But that just, that constraint is not there anymore, and it's, uh, it's very troubling. And I'm talking like an old man, of course I am. But, uh, I, you know, I, I think, of, I, I listen to my kids and my grandkids, and uh, now great grandkids, so only one of them's talking, but uh, they, they, the, the way they, and they're all lovely kids, don't misunderstand me, but the, the casual attitude they have towards the social mores, I'm not talking sexual mores, the social mores that we once had is, is troubling. Well, sure. Uh, the simple thing of please, thank you, opening doors for people. Uh, I don't care if it's a man or a woman. If I'm in there first, I open the door first. Well, you know, I remember as a, as a kid uh, taking a streetcar all the time. And uh, if I didn't stand up for all women uh, and any adult male that, uh, you know, was, was, was getting on or was uh, in any way, or, or, uh, you know, had problems, physically or whatever, uh, or somebody comes on with a baby. If I didn't do that, I mean, uh, I don't like to say my father would have whipped me, but I, I'd have caught it good and proper. And uh, it was just a, the automatic thing to do. And it's interesting, you know, I, I, I haven't gone for a while because I, I haven't been well for a couple of years, but we used to go to London two or three times a year, and that's you still see that on the tube in London, not with everybody. You still see a lot of kids that just sit there. But you still see it happening much more, I dare say, than you see it here. But it's it's dying. The, just the plain, simple, good manners we used to have uh, are dying. And I think the problem with that, too, Jim, is it reflects itself in a lot of other areas as well. I mean, the way we treat our, our friends, et cetera, uh, that kind of treatment becomes kind of epidemic through society. And we really have very few people being polite to one another uh, as in days of yore. Maybe it'll come back if George Orwell can come back. Maybe we can bring our manners back, but uh, it's a much different world. We'll have more with Rafe Mayer right after the break. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. In Goddard, we trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rafe Mayer. Rafe, what's your take on what's happening on BC politics right now? It seems to me every second ad on television is telling me that anybody, it seems, can just get thirty-seven and a half thousand dollars from the government to buy a house. Well, it's it's an amazing election, really, when you think about it. And when I talked about uh, Mr. Trump coming up to help out uh, our premier. I was being half serious because I, whatever she is saying, it, it's just rubbish. Now, it, it's been rubbish for a long time, but we're in an election, and usually you expect to get some sort of, of facts come out of this. They're not there. And, and uh, BC Hydro, which uh, you will know, I've been saying it's a big issue now for well, six or seven, eight years, and there's been a group of us, really, that have been writing about this for that length of time. It's now really come home to roost, all these these sort of things. Now, in the meantime, uh, I uh, you know, open my ears and listen hard. And uh, where's Horgan? I, I, you know, I I just don't hear anything really happening. And and this may be one of those unusual elections where the government loses and the opposition doesn't really win, but it falls into the place where the government used to be. And it, it almost is beginning to look that way. Uh, uh, I, I don't you know I don't put that much stock in the social media. But when you look at the social media and you see that it's, what, 95% uh, kicking the hell out of Christy and her people, and there's problems in River City for her. Yet on the other hand, I don't see any uh, social media saying, hooray for John Horgan, we've got just the man to come along and and take us out of our misery and make the province great again. It's a very, very strange election so far. Well, most of the action I've seen is from David Eby, the former executive uh, yeah. director of the BC Civil Liberties Association. Well, he, he of course, is the up-and-coming NDP star, and I'm sure he's the one that uh, that Horgan worries about more than than anybody else. He worries about 
him, I would think, more than he worries about Christy Clark, because he's a very able young man, and he's not a, afraid to speak his mind, and uh, he's, his mind is a good one, and he's taken a number of causes, which uh, two or three of them, when they started out, I didn't think that they were going to have much traction, but he's given them traction, and uh, he, uh, you know, if, he, if uh, Horgan were to suddenly uh, take a long trip to Tahiti for a few months, I think, you know, he'd step in, he would step in, and uh, without any doubt would be the next premier. But as it stands right now, it's a, it's a very interesting game to watch. And, and I'll tell you, the only time in, in my life I've seen anything like this was in 1952, that's a long time ago, when the coalition all of a sudden just sagged. Everybody was mad at the coalition, and nobody watched a guy named uh, W.A.C. Bennett, uh, and, and he wasn't even the leader of the Soviets. He, he, nobody watched them. Next thing you knew, they were in with a majority just because the coalition lost so badly. Now, there are a lot of other factors there. That's a long time ago. Uh, the TV wasn't nearly as big as it is now. Uh, there were two parties in the government, not just one, and uh, so on and so forth. But still and all, that's the last time I can remember a, a government coming into power, not because of anything they did whatsoever, but because the government that was in power was so lousy. So, uh, you know, that, that's the, that's a rare thing to have. People say, oh, well, uh, you know, all you have to do is, is, uh, I think it was Tommy Douglas said when the, uh, when the government's in trouble, just stand back and watch. That's not been the case. That's not normally true. Normally the good advice is, look, that's the time you really kick. If you see the, the government down, then give them another kick. Make sure they stay down. But, uh, in this election, it's, uh, it's almost, uh, as if it was no election at all. And, uh, but it may heat up yet, I suppose. It's only January, and the election's May, but uh, my goodness, there's not much happening. Rafe, what was your impression of all these women's protests, not just in the U.S., but around the planet? Huge. Absolutely huge. And and this is something that uh, uh, I know you and I have talked about, but I certainly have talked about and have written about, the and, and, and it's not just women, of course, that I've been writing about, and others, that there, there is a a groundswell of discontent amongst people generally. But that groundswell is even more so amongst women because not only do they see the issues that other people see as being something terrible that have to be taken care of, uh, they have uh, women's issues that have to be taken care of. And, and they're not the old ones. They're, they're the old ones, but they've been disguised. That People thought, themselves the men you know we men think oh well, you know, it looks pretty even in the marketplace right now ah, it looks, the office looks like it's 50 50 yeah it looks like blah blah blah, blah. but women say oh no it isn't and i think they're right you only have to see the monumental lawsuits against the rcmp and and that sort of thing to realize that things have not been all right even though men have looked at it and thought it looked just just peachy so i don't mean that the women are, are marching for those particular issues what I am saying is that as a group of people around the world, they're, they're pissed off, and they've got a lot of things to be pissed off at, and, and Trump, uh, with the remarks that he made and the attitude that he took during the, uh, uh, the election, it's just absolutely unthinkable for a woman to listen to that and think, you know, I'm going to support that or I'm going to put up with it. And I don't blame them a bit. I, I shuddered when I watched him campaign, and uh, it's a new force, uh, Jim. Uh, we don't think of it as a new force because we've, we've watched the whims live and, and uh, the glorious items and so on and thought, well, you know, they're, they're doing fine. But they didn't win, and they didn't get everything that they wanted, and they didn't get everything they're entitled to by a long shot. Long comes a guy, and he says, look, as long as I'm around, not only are you not going to get what you think you're entitled to, you're probably going to go back four or five steps. And that's to think that that caused a, a few people, a few women to, to rise and and, and March would be one thing, but it happened right around the world, as you mentioned, and in enormous numbers, and I think that if we pay uh, no attention to that, if we don't pay proper attention to that, there are going to be a lot of trouble, and uh, of course Trump won't, he's too dumb to, but uh, I think that's a force that's going to cause a lot of upset in the world for the next few years, maybe longer, and I can understand why. Is this something that politicians will ignore to their own peril? Usually they do. And, and uh, you know, you, you see politicians every day act as if they're living in a different world than the real world. Uh, 
the Trudeau liberals, uh, amongst uh, others, that uh, uh, look as if everything's just peachy keen in, in Canada and particularly in British Columbia, uh, where it isn't. And they they get what happens, Jim. It's a it's a real problem. That, because I know as I've been there, you get sealed off from reality very very quickly. First of all, you're in a in a place that doesn't really have a hell of a lot of action anyway. It, oftentimes it's a smaller city or it's part of a city that, you know, is looked upon as something that, that's, that's very, very different. You've got people surrounding you telling you how wonderful you are and what a great guy you are and uh, the things to do and so on. And you've got people putting speeches in your hand and it, it's just an unreal world. So you become very quickly, if you're not careful, uh, unaware of the real things that are happening. And uh, uh, that's why, you know, if, if you had uh, uh, people, we had a guy uh, named Alex Fraser, one of the bridges named after him. Now, Alex was was scarcely the highest IQ in, in the world, but he was a political animal, and he could sniff out political stuff. And if nothing else, uh, he kept uh, us on the, as much as anybody could, the straight and narrow. And I told this story before, but it's true, but... We'd be sitting around the cabinet table and telling each other how great we were and how everybody loved us. And uh, Bennett would look down at uh, Alec Fraser. I always call him Axel. And he'd say, Axel, what are they saying in beautiful downtown Quesno about that? And Quinnell, of course. And, uh, and Alex would just rise and say, well, Mr. Premier, they're saying that's a bunch of shit. And we all sort of shake ourselves, look, and go, what's going on? I mean, I thought this was great stuff. I, I thought they, everybody loved us. And Alex, in a very short order, would tell us why they didn't love us and why it was unrealistic to think that they would. And all of a sudden, we had a new soberer look on the on, on the general public. Now, that, that was just a once-in-a-while thing. Uh, and, and we all lost our contact with the people very, very quickly. The opposition does too. Uh, the opposition here, some of the people that really have got an axe to grind and want to make sure the opposition knows all about that axe and, and keeps it sharp and doesn't, they, they don't look at a broader picture either. So it's it's one of those things where politicians generally uh, do lose contact with the people that put them there, and they're surprised as hell when they lose an election because the people said, oh, so-and-so was out of touch. Uh, they, they, they don't understand that. And, but it's a very, it's, it's been a problem forever. I mean, it's a, it's one of those things, quite obvious why it happens, but it's there. It's a very real one. Trudeau's doing his cross country tour. One of the questioners was a woman who's on disability pension. She says after expenses and hydro in Ontario, she's got $68 to feed her family of five. How can she afford his carbon tax that's going to add 12 to 15 cents a liter? Well, that's the reality coming home. You see, there, Mr. Trudeau is a very rich man, and uh, the people he's got working for him, by the standards of average people in, in in Canada, also are very well off. You know, when you're making 180 or 170, whatever it is, thousand dollars a year uh, for doing bugger all, I might say, uh, you look pretty pretty rich, and you're you're out of touch, and and they don't understand these things, and uh, you know. Reality comes in a very strange way. Uh, when I was health minister in 1979, uh, we didn't have the the uh, diagnostic tools, the scanners. We was just starting to get scanners and so on. The, you, you very, very seldom took a pharmaceutical. I mean, the doctor was sort of like, you know, uh, take two aspirin and see me in the morning. Uh, you, you never knew your druggist. Wow, have things changed. Now, we're still on the same medical plan. Now, I'm noticing, I'm saying to my friends, look, I wish the government would let me pay my doctor out of my own pocket to pick up my pharmaceutical bill for me. That's the big hit. And those sort of things are not being kept up with because the government people simply aren't aware. They don't understand. When they hear people like me say that, they say, oh, you must have made a lot of money, Mary. What are you bitching about? Well, I'm bitching just like everybody else is. Things were supposed to be... Uh, looked after for me when I got into my, my advanced years aren't being looked after at all. And the cost of what was supposed to be free Medicare, uh, socialized medicine, is absolutely staggering. And that's because the, the people that should be paying attention aren't paying attention or they're not paying attention properly. And they've let it slip. We have the same coverage now, I think. I, 
Uh, sure, that's what I think we do. Same coverage we did when I was health minister. And that's preposterous when you think about it. And uh, But these changes are not kept up, and uh, uh, the politicians are paying for it. Well, they're I paying for it, really. But, I mean, they're paying for it in terms of popularity. Well, I wonder why can't B.C. do the same as Saskatchewan, where the province mass buys all the prescription drugs so they get a huge discount on it, and all you pay is the dispensing fee. Aren't, isn't their job to help save taxpayers' money in the long run? Well, there, there are lots of things that could be done uh, like that, Jim. There's no question about it. There's not not the will in most places. Uh, you know, you, you would think that if B.C. is as rich as Christy Clark says it is, we'd be doing the same thing. Of course, the reality is we're not. We're, we're stony-ass poor, but you would think that other provinces would step up and do it, but they don't. And it takes leadership, and that's hard to come by because the federal government, although they don't have any jurisdiction for health other than in, in Native affairs, they have no jurisdiction for health, they put up the money. So they've got jurisdiction by way of contract with the provinces. They take the provinces, take the money, uh, guaranteeing to live up to the Canada Health Act. And the feds don't show any leadership in changing that. They have no desire to put out any more money. And the provinces, they can't do anything about it. It's federal statute. And they, they bellyache uh, a bit, but nothing happens. So it's a, it's a long stalemate. And it's, uh, it's got to be broken somewhere down the line. We don't have any better health care than in the United States. Who are we kidding? You know, we pretend we do. We don't. Not at all. Well, some people do, but by and large, we don't. And when you look at places like France and New Zealand and see what they're capable of doing, uh, and they're mad over there that they're not doing enough, and see what uh, we're doing, uh, it's it's incredible, and it's uh, it, it's got to change. Or once again, this is the, the these things are happening, Jim. Uh, why we've talked about this all around the world. It's probably two percent now, five percent now, ten percent, fifteen, twenty percent of people growing every day are really upset at what's happened to them by the governance of the elite, and the elite just get further and further away from them in terms of the money they have and in terms of their caring for people, and it's getting to be worse and worse and worse. That's why, getting back to what we're saying, that's why you have women all over the world saying, don't give me all that crap, we haven't got that, we're a long way from we're going we're gonna to demonstrate, et cetera. Well, it's going to happen to people uh, who uh, need hospital help and, uh, and medical help and so on, just sure as God made little green apples because it's reached a crisis and the crisis is getting worse and worse every day. <clears throat> are they counting on the fact that people who need that medical help are in no physical shape to get out there and march like those women did last weekend? Well, I think that that's got a lot to do with it. But, uh, you know, that will change. Uh, it's not going to make me able to get up and walk anymore, but people will find ways to protest uh, when it gets to the point where it has to happen. That'll slow it down a bit. You're quite right. Uh, a lot of people are, are uh, elderly, like, like me, and they just can't get out and carry signs and walk and do all the things that the, the younger uh, younger women can do. Uh, although there were lots of women that were a little long in the tooth, too. But, I mean, you know, we, we, there's no question you're right on that. But mankind is very ingenious when it comes to things like that. And there will be a way found to, to make that demonstration and to make it hurt. So... Uh, it's only a time, matter of time. The elite all around the world are in deep trouble, and it doesn't hit the ball that the trouble comes. It usually there's a delaying factor till people get organized and so on. But the next 10 or 15 years, politically, unless there are some massive changes, are going to be very, very difficult. Rafe, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you, Jim, for having me. My guest has been Rafe Mayer, Canada's longest-running, number one radio talk show host, and, of course, the most prominent political commentator in Lions Bay, B.C. You're listening to The Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Questions for the show can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on The Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.